So we're here today at the Imperial War Museum with Sir Ranulph Fiennes, accredited by the Guinness Book of World Records as being the greatest living explorer. A man who has been to the top of Mount Everest, traversed from the North to the South Pole, and ran seven marathons in seven days in seven countries, all after having a heart attack only four months before. Sir Ranulph, thank you for being with us today. One particular story which uh, surrounds you, which has perhaps shocked the world, involves an expedition you led to the North Pole in the year 2000 where you caught frostbite on your left hand and performed self-amputation. Perhaps you could explain a little bit what happened there. The Norwegians had done that expedition with two, so the only way of being first was to do it by yourself. I set out when there was a full moon and the full moon made the tide come up, which split the ice that I was walking on. So there's a huge amount of noise in the dark, minus 48, not good at all. And it all split up and my sledge fell in off the ice, 10 foot down into the water, dragged me down, 300 pounds in the sledge. So I broke the harness thing in order not to be pulled into the water. But then my tent and my cooker, my lifeline, because at minus 48, if you're not pulling a heavy weight, using your metabolism, you get very cold very quickly. So it was in the water, little bits of ice were falling on it. To get it out, I had to put my hand in to pull it out. So that glove lost its insulation. By the time I got 300 pounds back onto the solid ice, this had no feeling. This one was losing its feeling. I knew I had to put the tent up quickly and I got the cooker but in those days, starting a petrol cooker is quite difficult with two hands at minus 40. So I put one in my mouth and used the other hand, which I could feel, to pump the petrol. I could smell petrol, so that's enough. Took it away, but it was stuck to my lips. So there's lots of blood. Lip came off on it, and that was bad. I then lit the petrol, and there was a tent fire. It was not a, a good moment. And um, this one had completely gone. The other one was still a little bit of life in it. Four hours later, with the t tent cooker, I began to feel better. Cut a long story short, I knew that I would lose the tops of all the fingers. So I came back to the UK, and they won't take the amputation for five months after the damage. Five months of not touching anything, or it's agony. My wife said I was getting irritable, and so why not do it ourselves? So we bought a Black & Tecker bench and a micro saw and in the garden shed she bought me cups of tea. The thumb took two days sort of turning it over and then doing a bit, turning it over, doing a bit. If it hurts or it bleeds you move the saw a little bit away and anyway the physiotherapist said that I'd done a very good job. The surgeon was not happy. No. In 2007 you climbed the north face of the Eiger, something not too many climbers have done but more astonishingly than that you did it while suffering a lifelong suffering of, of vertigo how was that possible well I, I was born with ver vertigo and arachnophobia frightened of spiders when I was brought up in South Africa um, a spider bit me when I was a very small child and I've been very frightened of them and uh, I got rid of that in Arabia because of forced concentration with camel spiders and all the rest of it. So I thought, well, confrontation. I'm now 60 years old, or I was then, and I will deal with vertigo. So I thought, well, where's the best place? And my instructor bloke says, well, there is a place much nearer the UK called the Eiger in Switzerland, um, which will get rid of your vertigo, or won't. And uh, so we trained, because I can't climb, and um, one day we set out, it's 6,000 feet, and in the first 300 feet I realised that I couldn't do it. But by then, the charity cameras were filming it. It was too late to get out of it, so I had to carry on. And uh, it, was, it was horrific. And when I got to the final top, I thought, I haven't got rid of the vertigo. So I decided I will never climb another mountain. In your 40 years of expeditions in some of the most remote places in the world, do you feel that you've actually seen the effects of climate change? In the Arctic Ocean, 1970s, when I was designing manhaul sledges as light as possible, we coated them with a waterproof layer in case there was a bit of water on the way. By 19 years later, I was designing them like canoes because there was so much water all over the place. So even just by eye, there was a huge change. In the 
future of exploration, do you think a point will come where technology surpasses the need for human involvement? Or will the human involvement in exploring always be a crucial element to it? Well, I think in the last 20 years, um, technology has just accelerated to such an extent that one cannot say in so many years X won't be possible without humans because it might be the way things are going. That's, hy that's completely hypothetical. So I, I can't say what will or won't be possible. But in terms of exploration, that means producing new knowledge. Now of the expeditions that I've led, only one actually mapped an unknown area of Earth for 900 miles in Antarctica. Once polar satellites arrived, they were mapping everything from on high. We did the last great terrestrial mapping of an unknown, unexplored area in 1979-1980. In your 40 years of experience of leading expeditions and partaking in them, you've raised over 17 million pounds for charity. And I read somewhere that you weren't willing to stop until you've raised 20 million pounds. So what future expeditions do you have in store for us? I definitely would dislike it if I die before I get 20 million on my gravestone. So I def definitely want to carry on raising cash for, well, normally cancer in my particular case. And um, I therefore have got other things to do which need to be of a calibre which can raise large sums of money. But unfortunately we have problems, mostly from the Norwegians, whereby in the past if we announce what we are planning to do, you find they've got there first, so you don't want to stir them up. Um, so I'm not able to say what we are doing next. Looking back over your illustrious career, do you have a favourite expedition? In terms of actual expeditions, probably the one that took longest, uh, where well, it took 26 years, we failed seven times to find a lost city in Arabia. And each time we thought we got a clue as to where it was, you know, like Sodom in the Bible got buried, this is the Quran, but uh, we eventually found it in 1992, but we started looking for it in 1968. And after five expeditions, I said, that's it, wasting our time. But my wife, who spoke Arabic, said no, and we carried on. And on the eighth time, we found it. Wow, amazing. Thank you very much, Sir Not, not at all.